Hi, I'm Tom Burgess, and thank you for listening to the Profit for Purpose series from the Real Agenda Network of Podcasts for Political Change. We talk to inspiring business leaders about how we can build a sustainable economy that works for all. Now today, I chat with someone who walks the talk, who started his own business at 19, and that has grown to 200 million in sales. And now, at age 60, he has transferred control to an employee-owned trust. His views on how business should be conducted are very refreshing, as well as proven. We are pleased to welcome Julian Richer, founder of the home entertainment retailer Richer Sounds, to The Real Agenda, and we will be finding out his views on making the tax system fairer and more effective, and his ideas on how to be a better business. If his ideas were followed by all businesses, we would have a much more equal society, and an economy that works for all. It's not that his thoughts have not been said before, it's just good that a respected and successful entrepreneur is not only speaking out, but also trying to get the rest of the business world to listen and act. We covered many topics in our chat, so much in fact, that we've had to split this into three episodes and have ideas for more. In his first episode, Julian outlines the story so far and his plans for the future. In episode two, we'll talk about the more efficient and effective and fairer tax system and what can be done. In episode three, it's about how being a better business is better for business and also Julian's proposed Good Business Charter. So I started our conversation by asking Julian what he thought was the problem with capitalism. Okay, well, it's double-edged. I did an interview recently with Vanessa Feltz, and I started off by saying capitalism is evil, and she absolutely jumped on me from a great height and knocked me out in the first round. Luckily, I climbed back after that. So one has to be balanced, okay? I, it's what I do. My parents, would, my mum would have liked me to be a doctor, but, you know... I, like Woody Allen, you know, I hate the sight of blood, especially my own. So I couldn't be a doctor. And it, it's, I, if you saw me in half, it would say retailer. So I love retail. I've benefited from retail, from business. I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I've had a really good run from it. It's double-edged that the older I get, the what supposedly wiser I get, the more I study, the more I read. I realize about capitalisms. I learn about capitalism transgressions um, in history. You know, if you ask people of Indian heritage, they haven't got a lot of good things to say about the East India Company. You know, in 1800 they had an army twice the size of the British army to protect their, their uh, ill-gotten gains, dare I say. So there are quite a few problems with capitalism. And the first problem is, I think it's based on, on greed, fundamentally. Now, I didn't, I didn't become an entrepreneur because I'm fundamentally a greedy person. I did it because I had a chip on my shoulder because I went to a, a wealthy public school um, um, and all the kids are rich and I was but from rich families and I wanted to address the balance. So uh, I started trading when I was 14 at school. I went into it to make money. I became an entrepreneur to make money. I was unemployed, but I was a bit of a rebel and didn't want to work for anyone else. And also I wanted to be successful and I could have been successful doing lots of things which didn't make money and that's fine. And take my hat off to all those wonderful people that do great things without financial benefit. But I did want to do it. So in a primitive level, it was an element of greed to me doing it. And of course, a lot of wealthy people go on and on, don't know when to stop, and their greed becomes ridiculous. I read about the Giving Pledge in America recently, where the wealthiest billionaires pledge so generously to give half of their wealth away in their lifetime. And I'm just thinking, if you've got 100 billion, that still leaves you with 50 billion. So I don't think that's incredibly generous. You know, Why can't they just leave themselves with 1 billion? Isn't that enough to last the last few years? inherently therefore problematical because the more successful people become the more power it gives them and what you see as you know is the bigger the business is the more profitable businesses become the more power they have you know politicians uh, unfortunately aren't paid very little some people disagree with that but um, it makes them very beholden and indebted to businesses who can afford to give them uh, lots of money in lucrative consultancy contracts etc so you know we do have these issues surrounding capitalism which are, are fraught with problems and I that's a very long answer to your question, but I can actually talk about this for a long time. It's probably all one sentence so far. But if you look at, I don't do anything about football, but there are a lot of rules in a football match. And if you didn't have it, it would be anarchy very quickly. Driving a car I know a bit more about. Without rules on the road, we would have anarchy on the roads. Businesses, because they're so uh, vulnerable to temptation and corruption, uh, we need really strict rules. I believe capitalism is the best system we have. It's the system that's proven and stood the test of time. But it needs to be in a very, very strong uh, structure, firm structure of rules and regulations. And these capitalists that say, oh, no, we don't want red tape. It holds us back. Milton Friedman said it's all about profit. That's all that matters. He said within the rules. Well, 
within the rules itself is very, very ambiguous because the tax rules in this country, where there are a thousand allowances, you know, in, in the tax, there's 17,000 pages of tax law. So, you know, Milton Friedman made it sound very easy. But no, we need strong, clear, sensible rules to control the business environment in which businesses operate. One thing I think is very important is that businesses have a big debt to society. They're obliged to society and they don't recognise that often enough. The examples I often give is that I rely, for instance, on the roads for my lorries to get the goods to the stores. I rely on the police to protect my property. I rely on the schools to train my wonderful colleagues how to read and write. And I rely on the hospitals to fix them, to mend them when they get ill. Uh, I have a big debt to society. I rely on society's infrastructure. And these entrepreneurs, capitalists, that think they're clever ripping off the state, you know, their time has come. You know, it wasn't long ago we were lionising these people. If you go to Denmark, they're vilified. You know, it's just not socially acceptable to be a, a tax avoider, and we need to move the dial. And that's what I'm trying to do in my small way. And I think that, that has began to happen. Parts of the press and parts of the public thought it was really clever siphoning your profits offshore and, and, and boasting about how much money you save. And now those people are more discreet, but we've still got to do something about it because they have an obligation to society to pay their way and the public are sick and tired of them getting away with it. That will start with wages in the sense that a lot of people are just not paid enough to live off and therefore the rest of us are subsidising the company profits. Absolutely. So I look at it as the different stakeholders, of which the employees are arguably the most important. So there are lots of abuse of employees in this country that needs, needs to be stopped. We're one, of, we're one of very few countries in Europe that allow zero-hour contracts. I think there are only nine out of 27. Zero-hour contracts are evil. We have 900,000 people on zero-hour contracts. Now, the huge majority of people on them do not want them. They're unilaterally imposed on them. They're a very small number who have got wealthy parents, and maybe they're studying at college, and they don't care if they work in a bar for five hours a week or no hours a week, because that is going to pick up the tab, OK? But the vast majority rely on those jobs for their income, for their family income, and more importantly, to pay their rent. Now, the problem for landlords um, letting to people on zero-hour contracts is that their income isn't guaranteed which makes it nigh on impossible for these people to get this where it becomes sinister, and that's why I call them evil, these zero-hour contracts, because they're great swathes of the country where social housing is not available, as I'm sure you're aware. So they're dependent upon getting access to the private housing market. Now, I'm a landlord. I own hundreds of properties. I like to think of myself as an ed ethical landlord. I've written a paper on social housing, which I'm very pleased with, because I furious with the state of affairs at the moment in this country and we can talk about that if you like but zero hour contracts very very evil because people don't have access to housing now that means i don't know if you saw a program on the bbc uh, in the last year called the mighty red car it did indeed yeah you saw it. it was very fascinating that program it was fascinating yeah. and what you saw in there made and me cry they had did. a nurse there working day by day in hospital dealing with the dreadful things these nurses wonderful nurses have to deal with she was living in her car I mean, I cannot believe in our country in the 21st century. Now, poverty is relative. In 1850, Karl Marx observed workers in the mills in, in Manchester living to 17 life expectancy. Hmm. I mean, ridiculous. So we're not there anymore. But comparatively to the way we have so much wealth in this country, that is unacceptable. So what do you feel about that? What do you think? So is it ridiculous that the wealth is accumulated by a few? So since 1979, we've seen an 80% increase in GDP in this country in 40 years. When you take into account inflation, we've seen no increase whatsoever in real incomes. So that yeah. is wrong. That has just been inequality. The rich are getting richer, workers are not getting richer. And what we have is a tax system that exacerbates that. So we have higher taxes on income than on wealth on unearned income, which is wrong, is ludicrous. So it just means the gap gets bigger and bigger. And if you look at 40, over 40 years, that's exactly what's happened. Indeed, since you started your business in... 1979, that very, that very year. So there's no, been 1978, I lied. 1978, I was 19, sorry. Yes. So there's been a lot of changes since then. Yeah, and I'm one of the lucky ones. But at least, thank God, I have the sort of, hopefully, the awareness to recognise that and, and also do something about it. Now, I'm not the only capitalist criticising capitalism, but I'm in a small but hopefully growing club and I've got some plans to do something about it. So one of the things we're trying to do with this with a series of programmes, Profit for Purpose, is to actually get that message over. Good. That there is more Good. to a company than the Milton Friedman shareholders are the only Absolutely. people you need to concern about. But it's really, what do we do about it? There are certain initiatives going on to change that, but it's not enough. You know, we're not addressing the minimum wage, so we're paying people paid not enough to live off, and then they're being taxed on it. So what can we do to change that? Well, I like to think that I am actually trying to do a few things that I'm happy to talk about. The first thing I did was write a book, okay, which has 
been quite well received. And then sort of walking the talk, which I've done, I've transferred 60% of my business to this trust, which is I think the biggest one since John Lewis in 1929. And that was that did receive tremendous publicity from the press, which I completely unexpectedly, I've got to say, but I would do it again tomorrow. It was a wonderful moment, I think, for me and for the business. We, I've just come from our first ever trustees meeting around the corner, where I'm not allowed to say anything because I'm not chairing the, the, the meeting, which does not happen to me before in 40 years. So that, that's something I'm doing. Then, more importantly, I'm actually going out there. So zero-hour contracts are evil. Well, what am I doing about them? Well, I've got a few bobs. So I'm finding a test case against zero-hour contracts. I'm working through my third set of barristers at the moment because uh, like, people keep saying it can't be done, and I, I'm, I'm determined so-and-so, and I'm going to keep on trying to light a wall. So I'm trying to fund a test case. You know, Gina Miller can take the government to court. Why can't I on zero-hour contracts? So I'm going to try and do that. Uh, I've set up already Tax Watch. People say, oh, look, you know, what can we do against this injustice, you know? I said, well, look at me. I haven't been to college, you know, and I'm, I'm a small shopkeeper. I'm five foot seven, you know, and I sell stereos, you know. What do I know? Well, I say, so you, can, you can do stuff. I read this book called The Great Tax Robbery by Richard Brooks. I didn't know anything about the guy. And then I looked him up and I realized, saw he worked for private eyes. At the end of The Great Tax Robbery book, it said, this country needs an organization, let's call it Tax Watch, to investigate and expose aggressive tax avoidance. So I thought I'd track him down. So I struggled to track him down. I found his agent. His agent passed a message through. And I invited him for tea just around the corner. And he looked me up and down and said, what do you want? And uh, I said, I love your book. I love the idea. I want to fund it. He said, OK, whatever. And, uh, and thus began. So that's how it happened. I mean, I'm telling you this because if I can do stuff, we can all do stuff, you know. So um, he put together a tremendous editorial board, of which he's the chair. And um, um, they said to me very politely, look, you know, we'll do this with you, but you're not allowed to interfere. Da, da, da. Right, nicely. And I'm, for sure, I'm keeping, I don't even know till the stories break myself, which is healthy. You're absolutely right. And he's got this guy, George Turner, running, who's tremendous. Of course, you know, you get good people, they get other good people. So Richard got him in. So uh, uh, that's how Tax Watch started. I've been going a year. They really broke some big stories. The biggest story was the Grand Theft Auto story. I'll refer you to the Tax Watch website. We've got a, a board meeting in a couple of days. I'm, I sit on the trustees. Uh, but I'm not on the editorial, editorial board, and they're doing tremendous work. We featured that actually on one of, uh, as a new type, yeah. news item on one of our Brilliant. weekly programs. It was picked up by a hundred media outlets yeah. as far away as Peru. We discovered the story on Grand Theft Auto. That put us on the map. Now we, were, I'm very proud of the fantastic work they're doing. You've written three books on business. The latest one being the Ethical Capitalist. One is a bit of a cult book called The Richer Way, and that is a bit of a cult book because I published it myself. I did a talk at EMAP was over 25 years ago, and the guy said, it's a great story, why don't you write a book about it, and we'll help you. And they advised me, and I did it myself, a guy called Paul Keenan, who now runs Bauer Media. He's gone all the way up, and he's the, the nice guy that helped me. The book is, is about how to motivate people, how to get the most out of people. And I think the independent kind, he said, it's one of the best business books ever written, which I've obviously used that quote on the cover. But I do believe, one thing I've learned after 40 years, the biggest thing I've learned, I've learned lots of things after 40 years, the, one, the biggest thing I've learned is, is it's all about the people. And what I mean by that is they're two completely different outputs from people depending on how you treat them. That, that is absolutely what I've learned, and I observe it all the time. So my book, The Richer Way, was having seen my little business grow and be successful, I then was invited by Archie Norman to help him at Asda. And I was only interested in the people stuff. I was interested in cultural change, communications, staff motivation, customer service, and I put in a suggestion key for them. Don't ask me about IT or distribution or compute, you know, I, that's not my thing. But I was there for two and a half years, fascinating times, because we tried out stuff I knew worked in my little company with his 70,000, as we called them, colleagues, which was my suggestion at the time, and for a completely different type of employee. You know, they were completely different, and they still responded. Having experienced that, and I did this talk, and so I then wrote a book about it, and I just published it myself. I didn't want any publicity. I was very low-key for years and years. The only reason I've come out of my shell is this responsible capitalism platform is something I'm comfortable with. I think it's worthwhile getting my head above the parapet. So, um, um, but in those days, I wanted to do it very quietly. I didn't want to sign to a publisher who'd make me go and do book launches and signings, and it started selling. And it's been out for 25 years. Two years ago, Penguin Random House came to me and said, we've seen this weird book, and we gather you're selling a few of them. We want to publish it all over the world. So it's now being sold in India and Canada and Australia. I don't know why people want to buy it there, but I suppose people want to motivate employees all over the world. The product isn't actually relevant, and it's selling very well. So that's the story of The Rich Way, and I'll certainly give you a copy for your if you're interested as a souvenir. The acid yeah. test is, when he went to Arts and Spencer, I got a phone call saying, can you come and help me? And I'm now mentoring Steve Rowe, the chief executive, and we go to the same cafe around the corner. I have a little room at the back. It's my world headquarters. And uh, uh, we call it the naughty room because there are no windows. But that's another program. I mean, I can only talk about my little business. But we, we yeah. did translate there, and now we're doing it over there. So now we've got a lot going on at the moment. 
Thanks for that, Julian. That was most enlightening and encouraging. So those listening to the show, if you'd like to find out more about TaxWatch, go to taxwatchuk.org. And if you think you need to upgrade your home entertainment system, then try richersounds.com. So let us know what you think. Do email us at info at realagenda.org or contact us via our website, realagenda.org. If you've enjoyed this show, tell your friends and also give a review with your podcast provider. So what's up next on The Real Agenda? Well, watch out for the next episode of the Julian Richards series. Subscribe now with your podcast provider and on our website for a news update and you'll get notification. Also, every Friday we bring you the weekly wake up where our gang in the studio talk about how the real agenda issues that need to be fixed and what we can do. Not only can you listen and subscribe online through your podcast provider, you'll soon be able to hear the Real Agenda Network on digital radio as well. So a special thanks to our sponsor, Reverse Media Group one of the fastest growing search and media companies. Find out why at reversemediagroup.com. And don't just take my word for it. Reverse Media Group has just been listed as the ninth fastest growing private tech company in the UK. Now, one thing is certain. People want to see change to a more compassionate and just society, as well as more courageous politicians prepared to do the right thing for the people over party. It's urgent and it's up to us to make it happen. That's The Real Agenda. I'm Tom Burgess. Thank you for listening and I look forward to talking to you again soon.